Well, hello, everybody. So today we're getting into a new topic uh, called pseudocode, not pseudocode. P is silent. Um, now I'm going to be breaking this video up into multiple parts or this lesson up into multiple parts just because it does typically take more time in class. I would actually teach this across multiple lessons, uh, multiple days is what I mean by that. Uh, so we're going to try and break this up, hopefully in good locations that uh, will make it more clear to everybody, give people time to have a break and absorb and practice what's going on. So let's start off with talking about what pseudocode is. Pseudocode is basically another way of designing. Now in the grade 10 course, we taught you flowcharting and flowcharting was all about discussing the flow of a program, obviously. What that means is, you know, where does it start and what is the next logical step, the next logical step, next logical step until we get to an end point. Flowcharting worked great for small programs. It kind of faltered a little bit when we got to bigger, more complex programs. For some of you that got to your final projects that were breaching, you know, 2,000 lines of code, a flowchart wouldn't really be applicable to something like that. You don't use flowcharts for a full program typically. You typically use it for the solution to one smaller problem. So maybe a subprogram, what is the flow for that one subprogram? Pseudocode is similar. The difference being that flowchart flowcharts are a visual design method. All right, so we follow it with our eyes and we're looking to see how things flow. Pseudocode is more of a written format. And I'll be honest, pseudocode is probably my number one form of brainstorming uh, solutions to problems. So when, I, uh, when I'm designing on my own, uh, my desk is typically littered with little post-it notes or things like that of little jot notes of pseudocode. Now, uh, I'm going to teach you formal structure here today, but what's really going to happen is eventually you're going to break off and start developing your own little style and nuances. But the reason why we learn the formal structure is because that way it's transferable to other people. So when you're working in a team or whatnot, it's uh, more clear. It's more like a standard of practice almost. Now, depending on what company you work for, they may have slightly different variations on this, uh, but usually it's it's meant to be clear and readable. And if it doesn't solve, and it, def, it doesn't fit that bill, then you're probably not going about it correctly. So pseudocode is another form of design, as I said, meant for designing a piece of a program. You wouldn't, again, you wouldn't use pseudocode to design a thousand or 2000 line program or a million line program like windows or something like that, or probably many million lines. But, um, you would use this for one uh, solution to one problem within the program itself. So that is, what pseudocode is. Let's see if I can go through this whole point. Now, um, I'm going to be going through this PowerPoint. Now, typically speaking, I don't actually um, use the PowerPoints during my lessons, uh, it, but with all this at home learning that's going on with uh, uh, COVID 19 and whatnot, I'm definitely dating this video by uh, suggesting that in this, uh, in this presentation, uh, but it is when I'm making the video. So, uh, with that in mind, I need to be a little bit more clear and make sure that I state everything because while we're in class, I can clarify things, I can add more detail and whatnot. But if you're learning from home, you kind of need all that stuff right here on the spot. So I am going to be going more from the PowerPoints than I normally do. A lot of times I'll go off the cuff and uh, just kind of uh, fly by the seat of my pants. But we're going to try and stay true to the PowerPoint itself. Uh, that way you can always refer back to it if you need to, even the video as well. So as I said, in reality, pseudocode, its true purpose is not to design entire programs, just a chunk of the program. So what is pseudocode? It's just structured English for the purpose of describing an algorithm. So it's just an organized set of keywords that we use in order to describe the steps to solve a problem. Now, that should be fairly clear, but when you see it, it's gonna come a lot more clear. Now let's take a look. It allows the designer to focus on the logic of the algorithm. What this means is we take the idea of a programming language and remove it. It means there's no syntax that's specific to C sharp, to Java, to C++, to Python, or whatever language you work with. It's all just logic, which means we take out anything that's specific to those, to those, um, to those programming languages as well. So we would never talk about things like buttons and stuff like that because not all languages can deal with buttons. You want to keep it logic focused. When you're doing this, I want you to think about, uh, pretend like every program you're building is like a console program and you have to spell it out step by step. 
Now you're like, well, not every program I build is a console program. Of course it's not. So what happens is we build these designs, these pseudocode designs, the flowchart designs. Next year we're going to be talking about UML diagrams, but uh, we build these designs and then we hand them off to a programmer. Sometimes that programmer is ourself, but most times it's going to be to another teammate. And that teammate is going to take that logic, logic only, and then interpret it for whatever language they write code in. So for example, if they're writing their code in Python, and they see that you want to hold a collection of information, then they're going to set up a set of data using an array or a list or whatever. And a person working in Java may set up that collection of data using a completely different mechanism. Okay, So it's up to that, uh, that individual programmer to interpret it for the format that they're building it in. Okay, so we throw away the language syntax. We do things like we would never define a variable because there's some languages you don't need to define variables. You just start using them like they exist already. All right, so we're going to throw out all that kind of stuff. We're just focused on the logic. Do, 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 do. So rules. The rules of pseudocode are pretty straightforward. Um, all the statements showing dependency are going to be indented. So in C sharp, we use open and closing squiggly brackets. And then inside of those squiggly brackets, we have indentation. But there's other languages, for example, like Python. Uh, you can use brackets, but uh, typically speaking, all that dependency is done through indentation. So when the compiler goes through everything, it looks at that indentation to see what belongs to what. Similarly speaking, we're going to do the exact same thing in pseudocode. So what are all these different structures that we're going to be looking at? It's all about those control structures we've learned. Things like while loops, for loops, if else statements, and a case statement. I'm going to go into that in a little bit soon, but we're moving on. So here's the deal. We have this structured English. Now we're not just going to write out a paragraph on a piece of paper and hand it to somebody because that's not readable. It's not reader friendly. We don't want to deal with that. As a as a, a coder, you wouldn't want somebody to hand you a paragraph because then you're going to have to sit there, go through the paragraph, interpret the paragraph, and hope you get it right. Because if what you interpret it as may not be what was intended from the very beginning, and intent does matter. Intent always matters in everything in life. But anyways, action keywords. So the way that we uh, describe the logic that we want our programmers to take is we use keywords, recognizable, accepted, standardized keywords that we're going to use for everything. So each one of these situations you're going to see, so each one of these processing operations is going to have a specific keyword. And these are the keywords I want you to use. One thing that you need to realize is that whenever we use these keywords, we put it in all caps. And the reason why we do that is because it pops. It stands out on the piece of paper or on the document, whatever you're doing, to clearly describe that that is a command or an operation that, that it uh, deserves attention. So let's take a look at some of these. So if you want to get input from the user, you're just going to use the keyword read, like read user age. Very simple. Output, display. Compute, well, compute. So if you want to calculate something, you just write compute and then your equation or your formula, whatever you're doing. Initialize. So this is set. Now this is not the same thing as defining a variable. This is like assigning a starting value to a variable. And depending on the type of program you're building, that may be important. Okay, so you may have like some starting, uh, starting score for a player. You might want to set their score to zero or something like that, depending on what the game is or what the software is, I should say. Add one increment well if there's an add one there's obviously a subtract one which would be decrement so increment and decrement call a sub program call i i don't know how else to say that that's that's about as easy as it comes uh state parameters for your sub program with so you might say call calculate area with length and width return a value for from a sub program return See what you can see. You're looking at this. These, these all seem pretty obvious and straightforward. That's the idea, right? It should be common sense. So the idea is that when somebody reads a pseudocode, it's just clear. It's instantly clear. Readability. And then finally, a last one: Boolean logic statements, and, or, and not. So if you want to make like a compound if statement, like a compound selection statement, you might say if the number is greater than five and the number is less than ten, then do stuff whatever that stuff may be. Great. So we're looking at these structures now. Now I mentioned that pseudocode, the whole point of pseudocode is to describe the solution to an algorithm. 
Now, what are the different structures that these can take? We're going to talk about five specific structures that we see in pseudocode. We see these same five structures in our regular programs, obviously, but let's take a look at uh, what, how they look in uh, pseudocode. Sequence. This is just a series of commands, one after another. While, obviously, a conditional loop. Now, if we have a conditional loop, we must have a counted loop, which is four. If, then, else. This is specifically for one or two choices. If, then, else statements. You notice that there is not an else if. Else if does not exist in pseudocode. So how do we handle when we have more than two choices? We use a case statement. Now, let me be very clear. Case does not mean that you have to make a switch statement in your code. Again, that is up to the programmer to decide how they want to actually articulate that case statement. Are they going to write it as a switch statement? Well, they can only do that if they're doing things like checking equality, right? They can't do it if they're doing ranges of values or whatnot. But that's irrelevant to our pseudocode. To our pseudocode, what we're saying is uh, whenever we have more than two choices, we are going to use a case statement. You'll see how that comes to be. Now, the next few slides are just going to basically go over these different structures um, and spell them out. Now, I'm not going to probably get through all of them today. I'm going to get through a few of them, and then we're going to move on in the next video. So let's start off with sequence. So a sequence. So this is just code that runs from top to bottom. This is just an ordered series of commands. No problem, right? Sequential code, sequential control is indicated by writing one, one action after another. The important thing is because they're in a sequence means there's no dependency, which means they just run one after another and means there's no indentation. All right, so everything is perfectly in line. Well, let's take a quick look what that actually looks like. Here's a simple example. Set height to 2.5. Set width to 5. Compute area equals height times width. Display the area is plus area. Now a couple of things, I highlighted them here. Uh, you'll notice that where I have set height to 2.5, I could have just as easily written set height equal 2.5. It's perfectly fine. I would accept, I wouldn't take marks off, but it, it is a little uh, less reader friendly. So it's up to you how you want to do that and what you're more comfortable with. But again, I wouldn't take off any marks for that. Uh, similarly speaking for the set width to five, you could do the exact same thing. Down below where you see the display, display, the area is plus area. You'll notice that we still use concatenation. So when you want to uh, append a variable inside of your output, we need to break up what is actually text and what is actually variables. And we do use standard uh, rules for concatenation. So uh, everybody reading this code will actually understand. Now, if I were to hand you a piece of paper with this code on here, it would be your job to then uh, convert this logic into code. And you might write it something pretty simple. Let's take a look here. Da, 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 da. So let's say if I'm going to write the logic for this in C sharp, the first thing I'm going to have to do, well, it says set height to 2.5. Well, I don't have a height yet. So I might write something like int height equal or hint height. And it says set it 2.5. Okay, so I can set it 2.5 immediately. Int width equals 5, right? Now it says compute area. All right, very simple. Area equals uh, height Oops. times width. And then finally, our final display statement console dot right line. The area is plus oops area. And that's it. We've just converted that pseudocode into actual code. Where would this be put? Probably inside of your main, inside of your console program, whatever. But that's all it takes. We just convert it line to line into actual code. You'd be like, well, why don't I just write the code? Well, not everybody can read your code. And depending on what language it needs to be written in, you may not know, you just want the logic. Again, you're probably not gonna be the one who's actually gonna be using your, uh, your actual logic here. All right, well, let's keep moving on. Uh, so this is the last one I'm gonna do in this video, and then, we're gonna, and then we're gonna take a break and we'll go on to the next video. So this is for our simple selection, if, then, else. We're making one or two choices. So. Uh, this is just basic Boolean comparisons. We're going to need four keywords to actually do this. Very simple. If, then, else, and end if. You know, I mentioned before that we don't have brackets. So how do we say when an if statement ends? Well, we kind of surround it with the text, if, end if. All our control structures are going to use this exact same thing. While, end while, for, end for, case, end case. It basically creates a container, and everything in between belongs to that container. Okay, 
So we're going to use these when we want to describe simple if statements. Now, simple if statements are either a just straight if statement or an if else statement. Pretty clear. Let's take a quick look. So the general form is very simple. If some condition is true, then do a sequence of code. Whatever that sequence is, it might be one line, it might be five lines, it might be 25 lines. I don't know. Else, do a different sequence of code. All right, so here we have two choices. Now, obviously, I said that the this is good for both if statements as well as if else statements. That implies that your else sequence two is completely optional. If you don't have it there, then it's just a simple if statement. Okay? Now let's look at some actual logic for this. Do, 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 do. If hours worked is greater than normal max hours, then do something. Well, we're going to display some message that says overtime message. Why? Because the number of hours worked is bigger than the maximum of hours they're supposed to work. So they've worked overtime. So we display an overtime message, whatever overtime message is. If not, well, then we just display the regular time message. You worked 40 hours this week or whatever it is your hours are. Right? Very simple program. You see the keywords all capitalized, if, then, else, and if. You see how the dependent logic is indented inside. Very clear. Okay, so that's where we're going to start for this one. The next one we're going to get into multi-selection, which means more than two choices.